all uh, to this installment of the Advanced Transportation Technology Seminar. Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Lauren Terveen uh, be our guest speaker this week. Uh, uh, he tells me that he's a reformed uh, computer scientist who uh, found that uh, people are more interesting than computers. I'm wondering how many of you would agree. Uh, but anyway, uh, just very quickly, he received his PhD at the University of Texas, Austin, and then spent uh, about 10 years at ATT Bell Labs on the east and then uh, joined the University of Minnesota in 2002. So he's been here, uh, I guess, almost going on 10 years, long time. Uh, anyway, without further ado, just want to remind people uh, that there are lots of folks off campus. And so if anybody asks a question, we really need to use a microphone so people off campus can hear your question. Uh, but without further ado, uh, title of this talk, and by the way, I think this is the first time uh, we've had a speaker talking about technology uh, related to bicycling, so we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe it is, yes. Okay, so thank you for that introduction. Um, let me get started. So I want to start out by talking a little bit about a technology that we build on in Cyclopath, the well-known technology of a wiki. Now, we're used to wikis today with Wikipedia mainly and other such systems, but I think we should step back and realize that if you think about it, wikis are a crazy idea. Wikis say, you know, let's let anybody edit a web page. I've got a website. I don't care who edits it. Anybody can edit it. And then maybe afterwards we'll clean things up. Now, that's a crazy idea. And even if you know the history of Wikipedia, this is not the way the online encyclopedia got started. Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger had a different idea. They had a whole very detailed process that they had in mind for people on the internet to be able to uh, produce an encyclopedia. It was a very good process, very detailed. And after a year or so, I think they had managed to get seven articles written. Okay. So that didn't work out so well. And then they heard about this idea of a wiki. It was kind of a crazy idea, but it worked out for them. But let's not forget, wikis are a crazy idea. So we decided to build one. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do now is walk you through the functionality of our Cyclopath system. And then after that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the research we've done with it and some of our current research and development directions. So this is Cyclopath. You can go to it at cyclopath.org. And um, the first face of Cyclopath that you notice is you can request routes, bicycle routes in this case. It's tailored for bicycling. I've requested a route here from um, our building, the uh, Keller Hall, to, uh, to uh, a theater in Uptown. Okay? And in response to that request, the system will compute a route for me. And then we'll display it for me on the map with this uh, very nice uh, yellowish line. OK, so so far, so good. Pretty standard stuff. Now, there are a few things, even in this image, that I want to point out that are not quite so standard. Um, one thing is, over on the uh, it's your left side of the screen, you see a cue sheet, step-by-step -step instructions for, um, for how you should ride this route. This is a standard um, format bicyclists use uh, to take with them, and that's the format we use. So you get the map display and the cue sheet. Um, yeah, you can print it out, so that's useful. You can export it as GPX, so we've had that functionality for a long time, so you can download it to whatever GPS device you might have if you like to use a GPS while you're riding. Um, you can share. Uh, you can share the route with other people by creating a URL to refer to it. Um, now, here's something that we think is kind of nice. Uh, you notice the, the route line here. You know, this is a place for us, an opportunity for us to communicate information about the route so people can comprehend it better at a glance. And so we have different information you can encode using the color of the route. Um, in this current display, we have uh, color being used to encode the slope, how hilly it is. I can change it to encode 
the, uh, the type of block or byway, the road segment, so you can see at a glance, you know, which parts of it are on bicycle paths, which parts of it are on roads. You can also encode the predicted rating, how much the system thinks you'll like the individual segments of the route. And yeah, so that's what you can do. So that's great. But uh, Google Maps can find bike routes as well, as probably many of you know. Now, when we started Cyclopath, when we first got uh, released it, that was not true. I think we were up and running for about a year and a half before Google added uh, bike mapping functionality. And we can sort of offline talk about how we compare to Google as far as that goes. But I want to talk about some other ways that we're different from, uh, that we are uh, distinctive. Now, as I said at the beginning, Cyclopath also is a wiki a geographic wiki, which is an instance of an open content system where end users can um, produce and share content that is valuable. So I'm going to walk you through an example showing why this is the case, why it is valuable. And before I do that, I want to sort of step back and tell you a little bit about how we got started in Cyclopath. Um, you know, you look at our map, this is an image of uh, the Cyclopath map zoomed in to a particular area. There's a lot of data about roads there, obviously. Um, we didn't have people contribute that all from scratch, unlike OpenStreetMap, for example. Instead, we started out by getting data from MnDOT, uh, the best data we could for a road data set, uh, green, green space, uh, lakes, rivers, water, um, and also bicycle trails. So we started out with that, but we still claimed, and we now have evidence that there is value in user-generated input. And I want to give you ex an example here of some user input that is useful. So if you sort of look over here, you kind of see here's 5th Street Southeast, here's 5th Street Southeast, and you know, no connection between them in, in the map. Okay. But if you turn on the aerial photos, you kind of see, well, looks like there kind of is a connection there, but we did not know about it in our uh, database when we started out. Okay, so we can zoom in, and yeah, we can see it there. There is, there is a sidewalk, and there it is. So I, as a user, any user could say, you know what, I'm going to fix things up. I'm going to edit this map, just like you can go edit a Wikipedia page, the text of a Wikipedia page, here you can edit the map and add information that's missing. Okay. And so, let me pop back up a second. We have editing tools that let people do just that. Now the first tool is simply to add a block, a segment, a, a block of roadway or trail that, um, that needs to be added. Okay. So I've done that here. I've created a little tiny chunk of block, it's just a graphical object. And now my job is going to be to manipulate that to get it uh, actually to match up the geometry of that sidewalk. So let me show you how we do that. Um, oh, what am I going to say? I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so there we go. So I'm stretching it out here. I'm getting it into place. Okay, so I'm still showing you how we do that. And then what I need to do next is, as I'm getting it to actually match the geometry of the actual, uh, the actual uh, sidewalk in this case, the next thing I need to do is actually hook it into the existing uh, topology, to the existing network, so that the system knows that this new sidewalk is actually hooked in to the existing uh, network. And so that's what I'm showing you here. So now I've actually hooked it in to the existing network and made it match the uh, geometry of the thing that I've added. And now I'm telling the system, look, this is a sidewalk. Okay, so that's good. Okay, so you might anticipate there's other systems that can do this. OpenStreetMap can do that. But we also have a rich infrastructure to let users annotate uh, the map. So as we move along here, 
we can see things that people can do. They can add textual notes associated with um, segments. They can say things, well, like this is a nicer way to get across the freeway than the nearby roads, but watch out for students late for class. Okay, so helps you understand what it's like to uh, ride a route over this sidewalk. Okay, um, and as you look at this, browse through it, you can see what notes are available for it. You can also enter tags, short keywords. Um, so here I'm showing we have entered a few tags already, hill, pedestrian bridge, spiral, and entering nice view as another tag. Okay. I can create discussions. We have a, an integrated discussion system in Cyclopath, and you can link uh, topics in the discussion to actual uh, geographic objects. So I can associate a discussion with this bridge. And it says here, uh, here's my message I'm thinking about posting. I've encountered broken glass along this bridge on a couple occasions. Does anyone else, does anyone know who to contact about this? The U or MnDOT? And then when I post that, we have, um, we're saying here that this is actually associated with the Fifth Street pedestrian bridge, I think is what we called it here. And then the cool thing is when you are browsing the map as a user, you can just see automatically any discussions that are going on about any objects in the visible area. So it's a way of focusing conversation. Okay. Yeah, that's all talking about the threads. And then another thing you can do as far as annotating the roadways is you can put in ratings. And this is important and sort of fits very strongly with our initial idea for Cyclopath, namely we wanted to create good routes for bicyclists. Um, our um, background, our history, and our research group is doing recommender systems where we recommend items to people. And a, a basic foundation for that is you have people rate items and tell you how much uh, they like them. It works for books, it works for movies, well it works for bicycling too. We let people rate the segments of the transportation network and tell us how much they like them in terms of their bikeability. And you can rate them on a scale from impassable to excellent. And then once those ratings are put into the system, our route finding algorithm will use those ratings to generate routes for users upon request. Okay. So now, uh, remember, I started this whole walkthrough by showing you how to request uh, a route in Cyclopath. Well, I showed you sort of the tip of the iceberg. You can, if you want, simply say, here's my start and here's my destination, and that's fine. We'll get a good route for you that way. But we also let you tailor your request a number of ways. Um, we let you specify a trade-off between minimizing the distance of the route that you get and maximizing the bike ability. So, you know, I don't care where you route me, I want it to be short as possible versus I absolutely want the most bikeable route, doesn't matter if it's really long. Okay. We also let you give us more fine-grained uh, specification of what you like and don't like by using tags. And remember, this is interesting because tags are user-generated and now users can use that user-generated content to control the routes they get. So you can say, for example, that hills might be something you, what did I say? Oops, let me go back up. Hills might be something you want to avoid, okay? You might say that if it has a bike lane, you prefer that, so give it a bonus. And you might say if it's marked as prohibited, you actually want to avoid it, okay? You don't want to ride on prohibited uh, things. Okay. okay, so all that's great. Uh, and if I were only talking about Cyclopath, I might stop there. Um, but I want to do more than that. I want to talk about the uh, science or the research that we have been able to do with this system that we've built. And it's useful, I think, 
maybe I have a slide later, I don't remember. It's useful to point out that Psychopath serves a dual role for our group. Um, on the one hand, we absolutely believe that, or it's intended, designed to be a great service for bicyclists. Uh, we think it's useful and we have some evidence that it is. Um, on the other hand, we are a research group in computer science and our particular slant is human-computer interaction and social computing. So we had better be able to do research based on what we've done with Cyclopath. We have been able to do that, and I'm going to tell you a little bit, a bit about that in the rest of the presentation. Okay, so this is sort of a credo for us. Uh, good systems yield good science because they enable field experiments. They let us, as computer science, and computer scientists, and designers of new interaction techniques to say, you know what, we've got this new idea for an algorithm to do X. Rather than simply trying to convince people it's a good idea, we can introduce it, we can deploy it in the systems that we have built, and we can experimentally see how our users use and get benefits from these new features. So if I think generally about our research agenda in our group, we are interested in value and participation in open content systems. Value, what is the value of user-generated content? Can we enhance the value that users produce and how can we understand what makes users want to participate in these systems and hopefully encourage them to do more and to do better participation. So I'm not going to cover all of those topics today. Um, I'm going to give you a brief preview of a couple um, studies we have done and then I'm going to talk a little bit at the end, time permitting, about some things that are going on right now. So the first thing I want to talk about is how should we quantify the value of a, uh, of a system like this? And then I'm going to talk about a study we've done to try to get p more contributions to Cyclopath. Okay. Well, trying to pop back down into the real world. I mean, I started out by showing you Cyclopath, a, a web-based system. But what we really are uh, about as an application domain is helping bicyclists with this task of navigating a bicycle, of riding their bicycle around, of finding routes. Now, this is hard. It's hard even with today's bicycles. OK, it was probably really hard back then. Um, and it's hard for a number of reasons. It happens in, um, in a geographic space. Navigation is complex. There's lots of different options people have to evaluate. And the options vary, can vary quite a bit in quality. And so there's a need for rich information to help people make good decisions, to be aware of their options, and to select the options that are best for them. Now, when we started out, we did some early empirical work where we interviewed, um, I don't know, 20 or 30 bicyclists from the area. We surveyed even more. And one of the intuitions we had that was borne out by these interviews and surveys is that there was no one up-to-date information source that bicyclists could use to get their knowledge. There's some very nice maps available for the Twin Cities but it's hard to keep those up to date. Okay. We also obviously knew that bicyclists, or we found out that bicyclists have a culture of sharing information with each other, of exchanging useful information to select routes. So um, what is a GeoWiki in general? As I've shown you, a GeoWiki is a map that anyone can edit. Um, Users can add geographic data, as I showed you. They can delete it. They can modify it. And they can do all those things to the relationships between geographic data as well. 
Now, that's the part that makes wikis possible. But if that's all we have, this absurd factor like, oh, that's never going to work, would absolutely be right in practice because either through maliciousness or through uh, incompetence or ignorance, people would actually make bad edits to any such system and would mess it up over time. So the way you prevent that from happening is a wiki or geographic wiki has monitoring tools that let users edit or monitor the editing of others. <coughs> now, if you're familiar with Wikipedia, the tools are a recent changes list where you can see all the edits that people are making, watch lists where you as an individual can say, here are the articles I'm interested in, please notify me whenever anything happens to them, and diffing where you can see the difference in the text of an article before and after an edit was done. We did uh, geographic versions of those. Uh, we have a recent changes list. We have watch regions where somebody can say, I'm interested in anything that happens in this area. And we have geographic diffing where you can see on the map itself the difference between the state of the map before and after an edit was made. So um, we think of geo wikis as fitting into the larger ecosystem of wikis and open content systems in general. Other open content systems might be things like YouTube, um, open source software, question answering systems, where it is uh, basically participation is open to anyone and the value of this system is largely or entirely due to user contributions. Now the reason it's important to make this point is that we believe that many of the problems that we study in Cyclopath are problems that are common to these outer layers as well and thus many of the things we find out in Cyclopath will be of interest to people who are studying these broader contexts as well. Okay. So, as I said, we did this initial study even before we did more than get started on building Cyclopath. And one of the things we asked people, bicyclists, would you be willing to spend time doing work editing a map? Um, how much time would you be willing to spend? Would you be willing to spend a minute? Would you be willing to spend five or more minutes? Would you be willing to spend ten or more minutes if other users saw what you did in either six months or immediately? And you can see people are a lot more likely to say, I'd be willing to put time in if people saw, saw my changes right away. And you know this, this was important for us to give us some confidence that our idea was right, would, would make sense before we built it. Shouldn't be maybe too surprising. One of my colleagues tells a story about, um, he travels a lot, a lot more than I do even, and he had a bad hotel experience. And he put a review up on TripAdvisor. And he started getting feedback from the system and from other users just immediately, immediately. And he said, this was great. It, was, it made me feel so good. It was interesting. I'd go back to the site. I'd see if anything new had been said about my review. Um, and so the whole process of this immediacy of feedback based on immediacy of your changes going live is really powerful. OK, so Psychopath, we have this data contributed by users. Is it valuable? Do users think it's valuable? Can we show it's valuable? Well, we have a couple ways of doing that. We can count how much people actually use the system, and we can measure the impact of data entered by users. And I'm going to show you a little bit about both of those things. OK, well, when we started out in the early days of building Cyclopath, before we actually uh, even uh, publicly opened it up, we were trying to, for our own purposes, say when did we think this sort of system would be useful. And we said we think it would be useful if users have and share information which is useful and not available otherwise. Um, so an example I like to give is, um, you know, um, a lot of people 
are following sports scores all the time, right? They're following scores of football, basketball, whatever. So that's useful information. A lot of people have that information. Is it available otherwise? Yeah, it's available on ESPN. So I wouldn't think, I wouldn't be too interested in writing, uh, creating a wiki for people to share sports scores because it's already taken care of. But for bicycling, there's this useful information that people have that we found was not really available in a central up-to-date resource. Okay, so we have some data just based on how people have used our system. Do users have and share information? Well, we've had over 2,500 points of interest entered into the system, over 2,100 notes, over 250 distinct tags. Users have made over 12,000 edits or revisions to the map and we have over 70,000 bicycle ratings, bikeability ratings. Now, those numbers actually are a bit out of date, so all of them are probably higher by, I don't know, 5 to 10% by now, maybe more. So yes, users have knowledge, and they have entered it into Cyclopath. Is it useful? Well, you know, that's the input side. And the output side is, are people coming and getting information from the system? And the answer is, well, we've got over 2,500 registered users. During the height of the riding season from like April to October, we typically have about 150 people a day come to the site, uh, 175 or more route requests a day. And I know that bottom number is much higher. Maybe 70, 80,000 route requests have been issued to the system over the life of the system so far. Is it available otherwise? Well, I've already sort of alluded to this, but in one of our studies we did about three years ago, you know, we asked people, um, how do you get information to help you in your routing decisions? And what people said is, um, I talk to other cyclists, I get it by word of mouth, trial and error. I try things out, and I figure it out for myself. And so there was confirmation for the view that there was not a single resource that people were using um, to get this information. Okay. Well, so people are putting information in, people are getting any inf information out, but can we say anything about the utility or usefulness of that information? We can. Okay. So um, what I want to show you here is one particular example of um, the utility or the effect of users entering information into Cyclopath. And so in red here, we had, um, we're showing a segment of a route that we generated for a particular route request. In blue or purple highlight, we have an alternative route that we generated for that same request, okay? Why did we generate the red route instead of the purple route? Well, we generated the red route after, for that request, after a user connected up these two roadways, which had not been connected in our original database. And I'm going to talk about that issue of connectivity more in a little while. Okay. Now that new route, what can we say about the new route versus the old route? Um, well, we can say that it's 600 uh, meters, 0.6 kilometers shorter than the old route. So the users fixing up the transportation network for us led to this particular route being uh, shortened by 600 meters. But we wanted to uh, do more than just find anecdotal cases like that. And so what we did is we took a sample of all the routes requested by users in Cyclopath, and then we, we do this cool thing. Since we have a wiki, we have saved every state of our database over time, including the state of the database when we started before we had any user input. So what we did is we recomputed routes for all those requests at the beginning of time, which for us was May 2008, when we had all of our data starting from MinDOT, but we had no user, in, we had no user input. And then we recomputed re routes for the same sample um, in May 2009, a year later. 
And then we analyzed the differences, the average differences between the set of routes we got in May 2009 and the set we got in May 2008. We analyzed in a number of ways. The results we got in all of those ways were about the same. And the simplest story to tell involves the change in the mean route length. Okay. So before any user input in our sample of routes that we computed this data for, 14.8 kilometers was the average route length. A year of user input, okay, 13.8 kilometers. So the average route was decreased in length by one kilometer based on a year's worth of user data. So we think that actually shows value from user data. Okay. Yeah. Now I want there's there's another point I that there's another piece of research we've done, but um, I'm not going to go into that today. You might wonder, are we in fact you should wonder, are the routes we get with user input better quality than the routes we got without user input? And um, that's a little harder to measure, but we have actually done experiments with different algorithms, evaluating different algorithms for route finding, some of which use user input and some of which do not, some of which are personalized to the user who is requesting the route, some of which are not. And what we found is the algorithms that use user input and are personalized to the individual user actually are better than other algorithms. And so uh, that's work that actually we're not publishing till next year, but um, it's completed. So let me move on, and what do I have? I want to talk for about 15, 10, 15 more minutes. So I'm going to move kind of fast here. Um, a classical problem in these kind of systems is um, they work because users are willing to volunteer their time and effort, and it's amazing that they will do it. But users never quite do quite as much as you want and quite the work you want. There's always work undone always work that needs to be done or done better. If you've looked at Wikipedia, um, there's tons of things that need to be done in Wikipedia, pages that are stubs that need to be fleshed out, articles that aren't in very good shape and need to be improved, and so on. Every month, thousands of things in Wikipedia get added to the agendas they have of things that need working on. So a classical fundamental problem in these kind of systems is, how can we get people to, how can we motivate people to work on those tasks and produce more value for such systems? Okay, we studied this in Cyclopath looking at two types of work. Ratings. We always need people to rate more segments of the transportation network. We know that that lets us produce better routes for people and We've got, in the Twin Cities metro area, seven county metro area, there's like 150 or so thousand blocks, segments of roads and trails. And we have, what did I say, 75, 80,000 ratings. That's very sparse. Not as much data by far as what you'd like. So more ratings. We need more ratings. The other thing is what I'm calling here node repairs. Remember the example I showed you where um, we, we were um, missing a segment. Oh, yeah, the example I just showed you a second ago where we did not know in our data set that there was a connection between these two roads. And so the route that we were able to generate was 600 meters longer than the route we generated once we had that data. Well, why does that happen? Well, we started out with the best data we could, but those data sets were not linked up. And so you have situations where Geometrically, we see one segment crossing another, but we don't know if they really intersect or if one is a tunnel or a bridge over or under the other. Okay, so we don't know that. We also often have situations where we have sort of a T, where one segment will come almost up to another segment, and we're not sure, should they actually link up? And it's just an error in the data set that we started out from? Or does one trail actually end 10 meters from five meters from the road. We don't know. And so what we wanted to do is try to get 
users to help us with these problems. Now, what I'm going to show you here is an interface we built to try to get people to help with these problems. This is particularly for the node repair problem. And what we have here is a viewport where we highlighted for people with these sort of, what color does that look like, reddish color, places where there might be intersections, but we didn't have the information in our data set to know for sure that there were intersections. We analyzed and found those potential intersections. And there were thousands of them. I forget how many, 5,000, 7,000, something like that. OK. And we did a study where we, want, we had different techniques we were interested in evaluating to see how well they would work to get people to, to do these tasks. And so we set up an experiment to evaluate them. Well, one factor we looked at was the location. When, we, when people participated in this experiment, and they requested a trial, that is, trying out to go do some fixes, we would either send them to a random area of the map or an area we thought they were familiar with based on where they had edited and where they had viewed previously. Um, we also had a factor work type. Some of the time when people requested a trial, we would have them do node repairs. That's what this looked like. And some of the time they would have them, we would have them enter ratings, where we would highlight blocks where we hoped they would enter ratings. And then finally, notice those little red things there? Those are what we called visual prompts, visual indicators that said, hey, look here and pay some attention here. Now that's a factor that we varied between subjects. So every user was assigned to that condition uh, for the duration of, to one condition, either visual prompts or no visual prompts for the duration of the experiment, while the other two factors, every time they requested a trial, we would randomly assign them to one condition or the other. Okay. And so then to summarize the factors we had, location, either you were assigned to a familiar part of the map or a random part of the map, work type, either we asked you to do ratings or node repairs, and visual prompts, you were, for the duration of the experiment, either you got these visual prompts or you did not. So what happened? Well, we did this, uh, gosh, how long ago? Two and a half years ago. Hard to believe. Um, had it up for 10 days. 66 people actually participated. And our hypotheses are, were that visual prompts would lead to more work, that if you highlight work for people, they'll do more. Familiarity, users will do more work in areas they're familiar with. Uh, probably a couple reasons. They had more knowledge and they had more interest. They were interested in those areas. We also thought the familiarity effect would be stronger for ratings than node repairs because ratings is more of an opinion rather than a factual thing. And we thought people would be more likely to have opinions where they were familiar. Well, what happened? Well, let's look at the total amount of work that was done in visual prompts versus no visual prompts. Okay. So ratings. The subjects in the uh, visual prompts condition entered almost 2,200 ratings versus 676 for people in the no visual prompts condition. Okay, that's a big difference. Uh, Node repairs, it was 351 versus 82. Okay, so, you know, maybe not a surprise. People do more work when we prompt them, when we sort of give them a visual hint as to where they should do it. But why did that happen? Okay, well, one question or one reason that that might happen is more work per trial. So if you click on a button and say, I want to do some work, Maybe when you get assigned your work, you'll do twice as much if you see these nice little visual prompts versus when you don't. Did that happen? No, it didn't. It absolutely did not happen. So if you had visual prompts, the mean number of uh, ratings entered per trial was six. If you didn't have them, it was seven. The repairs, the node repairs, 
it was 0 0.9 versus 1.3. It actually was a little lower in the visual prompts condition, but no statistically significant difference there. Okay. But here's a hint that helped us understand what did happen. A trial happens when a user asks for it. A trial only happens when a user clicks on a button and says, I forget what it was called, like, uh, how can I help, maybe is what it was called, or show me, show me what I can do. I don't remember. Um, so how many times did people press that button? Well, if they had the visual prompts, on average, they pressed it 17.7 .7 times versus five times with the no visual prompts. So you know, my hypothesis, actually, that clutter versus fun, I'm going to sort of ignore that for now. My hypothesis is that people actually found the visual prompts engaging, and it, it helped them identify things that they could do and could not do easily. And so people would see those things, and they'd say, oh, that's cool. I can do a few here. This was really easy. And now, now I'm done with this, because I really don't have anything else to do. And I'll click again and get a new one. And I'll click again and get a new one, while if they didn't have the visual prompts, they had to sort of laboriously go through bit by bit and look around. And they're diligent. They like to help. So maybe they do more per trial. But after they do one of these trials, they're like, screw it. That's enough. I'm done here. OK, okay another interesting aspect of this is uh, prompted work versus unprompted work. OK. So I want to show you an example again. So. What I've done here is colored the map. I've sort of grayed everything out, except places where this is an example of work done, edits done, by one of our subjects during one of these experimental trials. And here, these were the two um, nodes we had prompted them to work on. They were highlighted. And all of these colored things are uh, blocks or segments that they edited during this uh, trial. Now, we call the stuff they did up here prompted work because it was directly related to those two um, prompted intersections, potential intersections. Yeah, we call that prompted work. And all of this work down here we call unprompted because it was not directly related to those things. I mean, look at down here. This had nothing to do with that stuff up there. But it's sort of like, well, while I'm here and I'm being prompted, maybe I'll do a little bit more work. And so now if we go back, these actually are the same bars that I showed you a minute ago, and I sort of uh, skipped over this part. Up on top is the, is the work done in the visual prompts condition that was actually the prompted work. And on the bottom is the non-prompted work. And just to sort of zoom in on ratings, if you didn't, this is not no visual prompts. If you didn't have the visual prompts, everything you did was unprompted. If you had the visual prompts, your, your actions could either be the prompted work or the unprompted work. And notice here, the non-prompted work in the visual prompts condition actually was greater than the work done uh, in the uh, non-visual prompts condition. It was greater. Here, it's not greater than, but it's a good fraction of the work that was done. So the interesting thing we found here is that people were able, were actually willing to do work even beyond what we directly prompted them to do. So this was a study that I thought really told us some interesting things about, um, about what people uh, will do in these systems and how you can get people to contribute um, better. Now, I'm gonna, one more thing I want to talk about here, the familiarity effect. We thought people would do more work in areas they're familiar with, did they? OK, well, let's look about this. Let's look here. Uh, for node repairs, this is the random versus familiar condition. Uh, no significant difference. OK. For ratings, 12 times more work done, 12 times more ratings entered by people when they were taken to an area of the map that they were familiar with. Why is that? Well, 
here's why we think that was. And again, it was something that we think is a general of general interest to these kind of systems. The ratings, if you ask people to give their rating for a segment, how bikeable it is, you really can't do that unless you've biked it, unless you're familiar with it. If you ask people to tell you if these two roads or trails intersect, you zoom in on the, uh, on the uh, aerial photos and you can tell. You did not need knowledge a priori. And that helped us make this, dis this uh, helped us think more deeply about different kinds of tasks that you can ask people to do in open content systems require different kinds of knowledge and thus you might ask different users uh, to do those tasks instead of just saying, hey, you know, we need you to do things in an area you're familiar with. Okay. okay. So you know what? I think I'm going to skip way to the end and go through a few things that we're working on right now because I want to give leave us some time for discussion. And so that's what I'm going to do. So uh, I guess that's about, we've published about 10 papers on this in the last few years on Cyclopath, various aspects of data analysis, experiments we've done, analysis of our algorithms, um, user life cycles in these systems. So yeah, so we've done quite a bit of research on it, quite a bit more going on. And I want to just lay out for you a few things that we are working on either that we've released very recently or that we're working on right now. Um, multimodal routing. So as of last summer, you can get a, a route in Cyclopath that combines transit and bicycling. Cycloplan, this is uh, a set of features that we have been working on to integrate, um, to integrate transportation planners and planning into the system, making it possible for transportation planners who are uh, whose task involves understanding where there's a need for bicycle facilities, planning new facilities, getting feedback from the public. Uh, to We want to facilitate that with data that we have received and then help them analyze possible courses of action. So we've got, um, we've got that going. Um, as of last summer, we have a mobile app, an Android app, where you can uh, request routes. And, um, and you can track where you ride and upload it. And we're continuing to develop that very um, intensely. We also have a new feature that has not been released, but it's ready to be released any, any day now, where people can, um, where we now have a route library where people can take routes that they've got, modify them if they don't quite like what the system did, put associate notes with them, and then share that in a route library so other people can find those routes. Um, next year, we are going to start expanding Cyclopath to cover the entire state of Minnesota. This is a new project that we're working on with funding from uh, MnDOT, so we're very excited about that. Some other research we're doing that sort of goes beyond um, what I've told you about so far. We're interested in new ways that par people can participate in these kind of open content systems. When we think about open content systems, the way I've talked about them, the contribution or participation we tend to focus on is people going in and entering information into the system, like editing the map, entering ratings. Well, we did a survey and, anal and you know, of our users, and one of the things we found out is that people think of themselves as participating in the community of Psychopath users in ways that we had not considered. They think of themselves as participating when they tell other people about Psychopath and recruit new people to come to the system. They think they have stories that they tell about how the system has benefited them. And so that has given us some ideas for new ways for people to participate in the system that we think are quite interesting. And then finally, we're sort of looking at this area that's sometimes called crowd sensing, mobile crowdsourcing, and looking at ways that um, the thousands of people around the city who are riding bikes with smartphones with them that are 
sensory devices and that our communication devices, the way they can do things, the way they can enter data into the system in new ways to make the system even more useful. Just as one particular example, one of the things I think is really exciting is thinking about ways we could um, make it easy for people to update conditions about roads and trails during the winter when conditions um, really matter a lot and when they ch can change fairly quickly. So that's a new chunk of work that we're, we're working on as well. And um, let me go back up there. And I'm just going to close with that slide up there. I wanted to acknowledge that this is highly collaborative work. Um, my student, Reed Prodorsky, who graduated last year, he had the original idea for Cyclopath. And we worked very closely together until he graduated. And we've brought in a number of other graduate and undergraduate students who've, done, um, who've made fundamental contributions to it. And I, I want to acknowledge everyone whose name's up there. So thank you all. So 10 minutes for questions, I think. Good. Questions? Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, when you're talking about the rating system, can you or have you shared that information with MnDOT, especially if there are routes that are rated poorly for cycling, that they might be able to use that to help update our cy cycling infrastructure? And my other question is, do you have information on the demographics of your users, and especially the users who are actually doing the editing and the, like, the more interactive participatory users? Yeah, uh, great questions. Well, we are working with people at MnDOT and Met Council, and we have shared various of our information with them. And our intention is to really use that, uh, l let them use that however they, they f see fit to understand those issues about where, um, where, so the way I would put it is finding places where people are being routed on a lot and yet the quality, apparent quality, the bikeability of those routes is not very good. So that's precisely what we're trying to get at with the cycle plan features that we're adding. Um, do we know anything about the demographics? Uh, we do know a little bit. We serve, I, I alluded to this survey we did. That was actually about a year and a half ago we did that survey. One of the things I remember is um, gender was about 30% women, 70% male, which is actually um, not so surprising in some ways. Um, and I can't remember what other demographic questions we asked. And that's something we want to dive into more at, and we're, we're planning to do some interviews with some of actually our key contributors. So again, since we maintain this system, for many of the people, maybe, I, in fact, I know most of our users, we have email addresses and we can contact them and, and do interviews with them. So yeah, that's something we're interested in doing more of as well. Hi. Um, is the software open source? And what are your plans to go global? The software is open source. Yes, it is. Um, our plans to go global, um, we would love to expand beyond where we are now. As I said, we're going to Minnesota uh, to cover all of Minnesota. And we are very interested in expanding to cover other metro areas. Um, and that's, that has various aspects. I mean, one of the interesting aspects is that um, Technically, it's not so hard to bring up a version of Cyclopath for a new area that's pretty good. But in order for the system really to succeed, our belief is we need um, people. We need a core group of bicyclists and, and advocates who will use the system, who will do some of that basic editing to link things up, because the data sets that we have access to, again, have these problems. And if we get a little bit of that core contribution, um, we think we could, we could succeed pretty fast. We've actually built uh, a version of Cyclopath for the Denver metro area, but we, didn't, we have not yet attracted that group of people. Um, we're in the process of talking to some people in India who really want to get a version of Cyclopath up for um, forgetting where is it. Um, 
yeah, I forget which city. And for that, we're actually going to use OpenStreetMap data, import it, and bring up an instance of Cyclopath that way. And it's, it's very interesting in that setting. The OpenStreetMap data for that city is not that good. It doesn't cover everything, but it's a start. And we think it, it could be a good kernel. And anyway, the people there that we're talking to are quite eager to get it going. So. Yeah, Lauren, um, I'm wondering what experience, if any, you've had in uh, informing users about transient events, such as construction that blocks uh, segments of a path, and adverse events, such as collecting information about where and when and why a crash might have occurred involving a bicycle? Yeah, those are two great questions. Um, transit events. We do have people who enter data and then manually update the data when things change. For example, uh, the Washington Avenue Bridge, which has been closed, open, restricted. So our users actually entered that and then changed things as appropriate. Um, ideally, if we had a large enough, active enough user base, I would appeal to the power of wikis and say our users would just take care of those things. I think that gets us quite a ways there, but it's not the full solution, in part because of what I mentioned earlier, the changing conditions of roads in, due to seasonal factors and due to very short-term construction. So we've looked at, so we're interested in, one, how, how we can create new techniques to make it very easy for bicyclists to enter information. And second, to have a notion of sort of the uh, having temporally, bound, temporally bounded information, that this information is only likely to be good for a short time. And then we need to actively solicit people to check to see if it's still good. So we've got some ideas there. The other thing that I think we're, we're aware of as a technique that we could do, but we haven't thought as much about, is to get input uh, to hook into some uh, feeds from the information feeds from cities or agencies where we could get information about construction that way. Now, did you, oh, adverse things. Uh, accidents. Um, it seemed to me one of the obvious things to do is to put in information about where bike accidents have happened. Um, now, there may be some of that in the system. I mean, I don't know everything that's in there. But there's been discussion about that in our, among our users. And there was a feeling that, I mean, there were people who felt like it was actually um, uh, misleading to put in information about accidents because each accident was sort of the fact that an accident happens here. What's the thing you say about financial? Uh, about stock advice, past performance doesn't predict future results. Okay, so the argument that some people made is that because an accident happened here, it doesn't necessarily mean that's unsafe and people should not plan based on that. Okay, I'm not sure I believe that, but it's sort of so far we've left that up in the hands of the users. That's another place where maybe getting objective data about accidents and importing it in uh, in bulk might be a good approach. Has there been any thought uh, to uh, using information about bicyclist motion and travel time to share that among other bicyclists? I believe there's a program called Waze.com that does that. Uh, so everybody's a traffic probe, so to speak. And that probe information is then shared with everybody else that day, that afternoon, so they know that if I take this route, which I've taken every day, today is not a good day to take it because whatever happened. Yeah, um, we have not thought of that. I have not thought, at least, of that particular application. But the more that general class of things of collecting data from people as they ride, you know, using sensors that they have on them. I mean, we're really interested in using smartphones since they're ubiquitous. We don't have to give sensors to people. And making use of information you can get from sense data is something we're very interested in. So with our Android app, it tracks where people ride. 
And we think that's great because it's going to let planners know actually here's where people ride as opposed to here's where we suggested that they ride when they requested a route from point A to point B. I mean, just sort of to tie those two things together, we're starting to do preliminary analysis of cases where people requested a route from point A to point B, and then because they're using our Android app, we know they rode from point A to point B. Well, did they go the way we told them to or not? If they did, you know, score one for us. I mean, that means our algorithm was doing something right. If they didn't, we learned something new. We learned something new about what people actu where people actually choose to ride, and that we can use that information to perhaps improve our algorithms and to improve um, to update our um, evaluation of the bikeability of different segments. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm wondering if you've thought of using any gamification techniques or strategies to help improve editing and use of your site? Yeah, uh, you know, in so at some level, gamification is um, is what we were doing in that lo in this experiment I showed you, where you're trying to make things fun, you're trying to bring in elements of competition. Um, we have certainly talked about doing leaderboards, comparison techniques like that. Um, and actually, in the crowd sensing work that I mentioned, we're definitely going to make heavy use of that. I'm going to end it off with one question off the internet. Somebody emailed a question in from off the campus. Uh, how much did Cyclopath cost to develop? <laughs> how much to tweak into a version for truckers delivering loads on roads? So. Uh, Wow. First question. Yeah, how first much? question. How much did Cyclopath cost? I actually have a slide somewhere that had an estimate of all of that for, um, from about probably two years ago. You know, it's one of those, it's a university thing. Students have been working on this. They've been supported with TAs and RAs. It costs many hundreds of thousands of dollars in personnel time. Uh, but volunteer time. Volunteer. Oh, volunteer, yes, volunteer yeah. time. Let's, so just at the university, the graduate student time, my time, you know, we're talking certainly hundreds of thousands. I think probably not a million, um, but volunteer time, hard to quantify. So, yeah, I don't know, 600,000, something like that, 700,000, probably more. Um, what would it take to adapt it for truckers? That's, that's a great application. Um, for people who don't know, there is a program called PC Miler, which is designed for truckers, and it has all truck loading uh, constraints, bridge overpasses, heights too short, you know, too low for trucks to go by. So that kind of a program exists, and the company who developed it is ALK Associates, a Princeton University offshoot. Sounds fascinating. Um, what it would take to adapt it is... So there's the, the first steps are you would need to make it possible and easy for truckers to enter the types of information that were relevant. So I, I don't know what that would be, but uh, you know, uh, load restrictions, way station locations, uh, traffic conditions, whatever, whatever is relevant. And then you would need to have the right algorithms. I mean, presumably the reason that what, what truckers would want done with this information is to be told, here's the optimal route for me to take. And I would think that the basic approach we have of routing algorithms that are sensitive to a set of features as you're building your route would work just fine. My, the PC Miler, I would certainly want to look and see how well that works, where it doesn't work, and yeah. So very interesting. Anyway, join, please join me in thanking our speaker. Uh, interesting talk. Two weeks from today, Brad Estoshan from Minnesota DOT will be speaking, and uh, he is the keeper of the speed limits and crash databases for the Minnesota DOT. Uh, I don't yet have a title. We don't have a title for his talk yet, uh, but ostensibly he will be talking about uh, crashes in the state of Minnesota and where we're going in the future. That's two weeks from today, same place, same time. Oh, wait a minute. Is that Thanksgiving?
Sorry, December 1st.